What's up, guys? I'm really excited y'all are here and that you joined us today. My name is Samuel Fletcher. I'm the director of Mana Students here at Mana Church, and I want to personally welcome you. Today, we're kicking off our brand new sermon series, Basics. But before we hear from our speaker, let's engage with Mana Worship as they lead us in song.
Hey guys, good to see you again. We're so thrilled you're here and we hope your experience so far has been life-giving. I would really like to welcome those of you who may be joining us for the first time here for MANA Online. If that's you, I want to express my thanks and say welcome to you if you're our guest. There's a simple way to let us know that you are here with us. I want to invite you to text the word GUEST to the number that you see on your screen right now. Now, you may have been watching MANA Online for some time now, but you haven't really let us know that you've been with us. If that's you, we would really like to hear from you. Please go ahead and text the word GUEST to the number that you see on your screen as well. We have a team that wants to connect with you this week, first to see how we can serve you, and second, to help you get connected deeper into the MANA Church community. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. At this time, I want to invite you to participate in worship through giving. We give of our finances to the Lord as a way to demonstrate to Him that we're putting Him first in our lives above all else, and that we are following His ways. If you're currently giving online through the web or the Mana Church app, please continue to do so. If you would like to give online today, you can give via PayPal simply by texting the word, <laughs> you guessed it, Mana to the number that you see on your screen. If you'd like to write a check, make it out to Mana Church. You can also mail it in or drop it off at our Cliffdale site in our Fayetteville region. If you're our guest today, please do not feel any obligation to give financially. Let's pray over the offering. Holy Spirit, we thank you so much that you are our provider. You give to us all that we need. Lord, you are the owner of the cattle on a thousand hills. You provide for us everything that we need. Lord, we give back to you 10% of what you've given us as a way to express our thanksgiving and our devotion to you. We ask that you would use this to advance your kingdom throughout the world. In Jesus' name, amen. While we're here in this moment, we want to take this time to honor those who have served and are currently serving in the armed forces. Let's pray for our military men and women. Lord Jesus, your presence is what fills us and is what takes us throughout our lives and even our every day in the most joyous and the most heartfelt and the most life-giving way. Lord, sometimes our jobs are safe. Sometimes our jobs are dangerous. Lord, those who put their lives on the line deserve the most. And we ask that you would fill them with your presence. We ask that you would give them provision. We ask that you would fill them with thanksgiving and gratitude. And most importantly, Lord, that you would keep them safe. In Jesus' name, amen. We're almost ready to dive into our series. Before we do, I want you to check out these video announcements. So I, I like Butler, but I'm gonna say Denver and six. That's, that's what I'm gonna go with, Denver and six. Oh, y'all ready for me? Okay, look, what's going on, man, the church? It's Pastor M here, and look, let me tell you this. You don't need me to tell you that you were made for a purpose, that God has created you and designed you to do something great here on the earth. We say it all the time about getting connected and plugged in to our growth track. But look, we don't want you to do that by yourself. We've created a series of small groups called The Growth Track where you can get in community with others and begin to discover what it is that God is calling you to do. And you can get connected and find out more information about our growth track by going to our website, manna.church, or you can simply speak to someone at the Connection Center in your lobby. Look, Manna Church, we want to change the world with you. We want to do it together. We want you to impact the circles and people that you influence and have connection and community with. Let's change the world together.
What's up, Man of Church? I want to say a great big welcome to you, whether you're joining me right here in this room or wherever you are on the other end of that camera. Whether you're in Mana Online, maybe you're on YouTube at one of our amazing microsites anywhere along the military highway, or at your of one of our multi-sites right here in the Fayetteville, Fort Liberty region. Can we put our hands together and make them feel welcome? I'm just trying out that for Liberty thing. I haven't, I haven't said it before, so I'm just trying it, seeing how it, seeing how it feels. Anyway, this week, <laughs> hey, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not in charge. But if I was, no, I'm not. <laughs> mm. This week, we're going to begin a series uh, that is going to focus on basics. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he's going to establish uh, a framework for a great many things in our lives. He's going to talk about how uh, we're, we're to live. He's going to talk about how we're to approach the law. He's going to talk about how to forgive. He's going to talk about how to pray. This, this Sermon on the Mount is it's really wide-ranging, and it's the most command-dense portion of Jesus' teachings that are recorded in Scripture. In uh, 111 verses, there are about 50 commands. And in this next series that we're about to embark on, we're going to look at what Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount as relates to really four key basic principles in our walk with God. We're going to talk about the Bible. We're going to talk about prayer. We're going to talk about fasting. And we're going to talk about forgiveness. Now you go, what? cool, so why don't you just like Call it something else. What, what, I don't understand basic. That's, that's a good question. A basic, why, why basics? A basic is important because a basic is foundational. The, basic, the basics are the foundation. I mean, the decor in your house isn't going to matter very much if the foundation's crumbling. Your skill on the basketball court is not going to matter that much in the fourth quarter if you neglected the basics of fitness, free throws, and hydration. And no matter how good Jimmy Butler is, they're going down in five. Anyway, (laughs) forever, this message will now be typecast to this time of the year because I just called the NBA Finals, but that's beside the point. If I said this a different way, your basics are the foundation upon which everything else is built. The basics in your life are the framework for your future success. If you want to test the, the, the indication of the trajectory of your life, I would encourage you to ask yourself, what are the basics, what are the habits that are currently at play in my life? If you want to change your future, maybe if you're thinking about how can I, how can I chart a course towards fulfillment, then I'd tell you, you need to pay attention to the basics because the basics are the foundation upon which your purpose and you have a purpose The basics are the foundation upon which your genius and you have a genius. They're the foundation upon which your skill, the foundation upon which your talent, all the things that make you up, they ride on the back of the basics. Basics kind of seem to be, you know, a neglected thing these days. You know what I mean? I guess you don't know what I mean. I'm going to give you some of what I mean. I sometimes, so I coach... um, I coach high school boys soccer. And after a couple of years of that, I've begun to wonder if the basics of hygiene are neglected by 16 and 17 year old males. Some of them are in this room. Some of them are on the other end of that camera. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I wonder if the basics of hygiene and deodorant are neglected. Boys, put it on. I've driven the highways and the byways of our great country. I've even driven through my neighborhood where it seems like the basics of basic driving skills are neglected every day. I I see you out there. Slow down, kids. The thing is, I read this study on the internet, and so, of course, I have to take it as 100% true. Um, I read a study on the internet that said that 85% of Americans would fail a basic math test if given to them on the spot. That, that, listen, that startled me because it was like, wait a minute, this is like grade school stuff, you know? You would fail, and 85% of Americans would fail a math test if they were given right on the spot. And I was like, Chris, man, thank God you're part of the 27% that would pass the test, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I found the 85%. <laughs> <laughs> 
85 plus 27 equals 100, which is also the speed limit, uh, apparently, in Fayetteville. So carry on, kids. It's going to be It's going to be great. <sighs> That was the joke. That's all I got. So, you know, you can write me a nasty email, but um, jonathan.fletcher at manna.church. My name is Jonathan. It's good to be here. This series is going to focus on the basics that Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. And today, I'm going to focus on the basic of the Bible. Now, the, the written scriptures date all the way back to the Lord giving Moses the Ten Commandments on the top of Mount Sinai when he met with Moses in, uh, in the cloud and he gave him the law. And Moses then went on to scribe the Pentateuch. Those are the first five books of the Bible. And the prophets, were all they all existed in written form during the period of history when Jesus is up on a hillside in Galilee preaching the Sermon on the Mount. So when Jesus references... Uh, the law and the prophets, as he's about to in a moment in Matthew chapter 5, he's literally referencing the written word. So today, we're going to pick up uh, in Matthew chapter 5. If you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. I'm going to join you in a second. I'm going to join you there right now, but I'm going to talk to you for a second because I want to kind of set a little bit of our our context, sort of reintegrate uh, where we are in the midst of the discourse of the gospel of Matthew and where Jesus is. He's on a hillside next to the Sea of Galilee in Israel's north, uh, northeast. He's seated. He's surrounded by his followers and his disciples. But it's important, I think it's important to note the distinction and to note the crowd that's around him. He's seated, which is the posture a rabbi is going to take in order to teach authoritatively. He's about to teach. And it's interesting because the first layer around him would have been his disciples. These are the these are the paid folk. These are the leaders, you know, the, the, the pastors or the serve team leaders or the, the people that, that do the business every day. But also, he's surrounded by his followers. If you read in Matthew chapter 4, it does, it, it, he goes, Matthew goes to great lengths to outline the crowd who surrounded Jesus in this moment. They come from a wide-ranging area, and they're essentially a cross-section of everyone who lives in Israel. I mean, we've got, we've got Pharisees and scribes in this crowd. We've got uh, followers of Jesus in this crowd. We've got folks from the Decapolis in this crowd. They're from uh, Jerusalem, which is, I mean, if you know where this is on the map, this is quite a haul. This is a sermon preached to the leaders that Jesus has in his, on his team. At the same time, it's a, it's a message to all of his followers, and his followers are from a wide-ranging uh, number of backgrounds. He's speaking to all of us then, All of us, the followers of Jesus, he's speaking to them then, and he's speaking to us today. Today's uh, passage is going to be Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 17 and 18. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read it, and then we're going to kind of go back through, and I'm not going to go through word for word as much as uh, more idea for idea today. But if you want to to turn there, I'm in Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 17 and 18. Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So in in starting this off, this is an interesting way to start off uh, this discourse and talking about the scriptures. Because... I've read the first four chapters of Matthew, and nowhere in Jesus' earthly ministry has he started, or has there even been a rumor that he's come to abolish the law and the prophets, and it's an interesting start. What Jesus is getting ready to do for the remainder of Matthew 5, this pericope, this, this, this portion of Scripture, and the rest of those that follow throughout the chapter of Matthew 5, he's, he's going to make a statement about the law or the prophets that this is what they call their scriptures, and, and he's going he's gonna to start by making the statement that this has been fulfilled and not erased. What's interesting is this is a real concern. I say this is a real concern because in, in the near history of the people who are surrounding Jesus, the Jews that are around him, the, the closest they've been to freedom for the last couple hundred years was the Maccabean Revolt in about 160 or 170 BC. It was led by a guy named Judas Maccabeus, and he led a revolt that established a religious government, and from that came a group of people, and they're called the Pharisees. 
They started this little group based on the idea that they would not allow the people to abolish the law and the prophets because they didn't want the people of Israel to fall away from God. And their intent was that the people would never again have to go into exile. In one particular commentary that I studied, there was actually some early writings of the Pharisaical uh, group that stated, and I quote, we are formed so that the law and the prophets might not be abolished. It's, it's really interesting to me that Jesus is going to begin his discourse on Scripture by basically stealing their tagline. He, he leads in by talking about what they have been telling people for 200 years, don't let the law and the prophets be abolished, don't let the law and the prophets be abolished, and Jesus is using their tagline as his setup to talk about the Scriptures. It's basically like Jesus is standing in his Adidas shoes at a Nike convention going, listen, I mean, here at Adidas, we're just going to do it. We've been talking about doing it. You've heard we're going to do it, but we here at Adidas, we just do it. You know what I mean? So once Jesus uses their tagline, he brings up this concept. Don't think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. This was a, this was a concern. This was a concern that was felt in the crowd. Jesus starts with their tagline. Then he says, I didn't come to abolish them. I came to fulfill them. So what Jesus didn't do is Jesus doesn't erase the law. He fulfills the law. So the question that begs then is, why the law in the first place? I don't have time to read you one of my favorite books of the Bible, but if you want to turn uh, to Romans, I'm going to be in the 10th chapter in a second. I don't have time to unpack the entirety of the book of Romans, but let me just say this is exactly what Paul addresses in his letter to the church in Rome, who at the time of Paul's writing is dealing with this very same issue. What do we do with Jesus and Jesus' fulfillment and the law? How, how do we live with these two things that are reconciled now that Jesus has entered the picture? What's happened in, in, the, Roman, in the, Rome, the letter of the Romans is in the diaspora and the, the persecution of the Jews and sending them out of Rome, they've left Rome and now they're beginning to filter back in to find an established church that's already happening. So we're trying to figure out how these two, they're not warring, but they don't quite see eye to eye on the application of a number of very uh, uh, deep theological issues. And so Paul is writing really what is his theological masterpiece to help us make sense of what do we do with the law? What do we do with Jesus? What about all these rituals? What about these sacrifices? How does this all work? Paul's essential teaching is that the law existed to show us perfection. The thing is, we were never going to be able to attain perfection, and so then Jesus came to fulfill the law. And what he does then is he offers a trade. Jesus offers to take all the fulfillment that you're supposed to make, and he trades you all the fulfillment that he made on your behalf. The thing is, it's not a partial trade. He says, look, it's all of you for all of me. Jesus fulfilled the law. So the thing is, the law is full, and now he offers to fill you, fulfill. Look in Romans chapter 10, verse 4. I think I'm, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that I'm hinging the entirety of the book of Romans on this verse, but I think when we're considering what do we do with Jesus and the law and Jesus talking about fulfilling the law in Matthew 5, I think this verse is the crux of the issue. Romans chapter 10, verse 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. What Paul is saying, what Jesus is saying, in Matthew chapter 5, and I'm using Paul a short time in history later to corroborate what Jesus has just said, which is a homeschool word that basically means to prove what Jesus has just said, is he's saying the scriptures find their completion fully in me. This is Jesus speaking. Scripture finds its completion fully in the person of Jesus. Why? So that everyone who believes will be justified. So what are, the, what are the scriptures then? The scriptures, the Bible, this is the standard. The thing is, we're not going to be able to attain it. You know that. I know that. We won't talk about you. I'm an easy target. We'll talk about me. I know that I cannot attain what's required in the scriptures. 
The thing is, that doesn't mean that God doesn't require my best because he absolutely does. What it does mean, though, is that Jesus is the only one who can perfectly meet the standard of infinite perfection. So I give him my best and he knows I'm flawed, so he fulfilled the standard for me. You follow that? That's what I mean when I say it's real important. That's what I mean when I say we can't just add this as like it's an attache to my life. It's kind of this app that I add to my shoulder and I just sort of carry the Bible around with me. It's a total trade, y'all. Jesus is offering to fulfill everything for me, and what he's asking for is my life in return. Jesus is the end of the law as long as you're in him. The thing is, if you're not, then it's up to you. So Jesus said, look, I didn't come to abolish the law of the prophets. I came to fulfill them. And then he says something very interesting at the beginning of verse 18. He says, for truly I say to you, Now, the reason that this is so interesting to me is because as I'm reading commentary on this, I discovered that the word truly is the Hebrew transliteration of our amen. Now, I don't know where you put amen in your prayers or songs or sentences, but I'll tell you where I don't put it. I don't normally put it at the beginning. Amen translated in English means so be it. And so it usually comes at the end. You know, if you're praying for your food or you're praying a blessing or something, you usually finish with Amen. It's basically meant to be like, you know, the end. I used to be a musician. I still guess I technically am, but used to be is the easy way of saying, don't ask me to do anything musical. Um, it's not what it used to be. So the, the double bar at the end after you're reading all this music, that's, that's the musical amen. It means stop, you're done, no more. It means you, you've reached the end. And that's how we use the word amen. But what Jesus is doing is interesting because he puts this phrase at the beginning of what he's saying. And the thing is, this transliteration of so be it, amen, he does this throughout the remainder of Matthew chapter 5. He's, what, what is he doing? He's making a statement of authority. For the rest of this chapter, what he's going to do is he's going to reference the law, he's going to reference their scriptures, and he's going to point out how his standards for us exceed their standard. What do you mean? What are you saying? Well, he's about to tell them, don't murder. So how do you raise the standard on don't murder? I mean, how much do you not murder someone? How much do you have to not murder someone to have not murdered them, right? Like, how does that work? It's deeper than that. Jesus' standard deals with us not just in our actions because he didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. So it doesn't mean that as long as, you know, I'm right with him, I can murder whoever I want. No, the command to not murder still stands. The thing is, he deals not just with my actions, he also deals with my heart. I can't just follow him with my outside. I can't just follow him with my body. I have to follow him with my motives. I have to follow him in my drives. Then he finishes saying, not one stroke, not one iota, not a dot is going to pass from the law until all is accomplished. This reference to iota or dot is he's referencing the smallest letter of the alphabet. What Jesus does is by ending this section that we're studying here briefly, he ends our study of this section by elevating the scriptures to the place that we hold them today. What Jesus did is he took in his body the ceremonial requirements of the law and the commands we are to obey, but the thing is we have his grace that's the glue that holds all this together. The way that we talk about the scriptures around here, we have an operational principle of our 12 operational principles that you'll learn in the growth track. Operational principle number one is the Bible is the handbook for life. We don't believe that the scriptures contain a worldview. We don't believe that they contain some good wisdom. We believe that they are the perspective. We believe they are the first and the preeminent perspective that governs our lives. Now, I just used a couple of, I used one word, not so big, first, and then I used a bigger word, preeminent. Let me define my terms. When I say that the scriptures are the first and the preeminent thing that governs our lives, by first, I'm talking about a matter of order. First, the Bible governs my life first. So you ask the question, well, do you look outside the Bible for wisdom? Of course you do, but it's a matter of order. Where do I look for wisdom? First, I look for it in the scripture. And it's a matter of preeminence. I'm talking about a matter of weight. If I'm looking outside the Bible and what I read inside the Bible doesn't seem to jive with what I read outside the Bible, it's a matter of weight. 
The weight is who wins, Scripture. So why would you study Scripture? I think there are a couple of reasons that we need to study Scripture. The first way that we study, the first reason that we study Scripture is to learn the standard. What he left us here is, is beautiful. He left us a playbook. Now, I've, you know, I've, I've, been coaching, I've been coaching my kids in sports since they were very little. Now they're that. Um, not so little, and they want a refund for the Taco Bell they drove through to get last night. I don't understand how this is working out. But anyway, um, I'm joking. I think it was Chick-fil-A. It's beside the point. Uh, <laughs> I've been coaching kids since they were, since they were young. And you can always tell the ones who weren't paying attention when you talked about the playbook. You ever watched little kids play sports? Can you tell which ones weren't listening when the plays were being read? It's usually the one like off by himself, just sort of standing over there. I started playing soccer at a very young and tender age, and they basically told my dad he needs to pay attention like when, when, we're, when we're practicing because he doesn't seem to know what's going on. Apparently, when I was younger, I found more interest in drawing in the sand. I'd been reading the scripture, and so I'd seen Jesus draw on the sand. I was like, I'm going to do it like he did. The Pharisees will walk away from me. That's Bible humor and sarcasm. And it's beside the point. Why do we study scripture? We study scripture to learn the standard. We got to learn the playbook. We got to read the instruction manual. The scriptures are, are the operating system. We all carry these devices around with us everywhere. In some cases, for some kids, I think that the devices are now like a part of them. If you take the device away, they're like, you cut off part of me. No, I just took your phone away. It's going to be fine. They carry around these devices all the time, and these devices have an operating system. Now, I know that there are apps, and I know that there are things that are built to ride on top of the operating system, but see, sometimes I think we waste effort and energy, if you'll follow me on this analogy, searching the app store when we should be dealing with the operating system. We're talking about basics here because I'm talking about the stuff on which the rest of everything rides. We got to learn the standard. We have to learn and obey the standard. So why would we study Scripture? To learn and obey the standard. And secondly, it's great because it helps us learn to hear His voice. Jesus is, Jesus is speaking in John chapter 10, and He's talking about Himself. He's referencing Himself as a shepherd. And He says He's the good shepherd. And then He says, My sheep hear My voice, and they know My voice. You see, the thing is, in order to hear and obey the voice of God, you probably better get a good idea of what he sounds like. Because the more you learn what his voice sounds like, you can begin to discern the difference between what your physical ears are hearing or what your emotions are telling you or what your mind is telling you, and you compare it against his voice. Again, we're going to talk about me for a second, but I've had moments in my life when a voice has whispered in my ear and said, you're not enough and said, you're not going to amount to very much, and said, you're not going to be able to figure this out. It's all on your shoulders, and you're going to let everybody down. Have you ever heard a voice similar to that? The thing is, the thing is, I don't have to wonder if that's the voice of God, because when I open the Scriptures, I read in Psalm 139 that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And at the same time, I read in the book of 2 Corinthians in the 12th chapter that when I am weak, He is strong. So because I've learned to hear His voice, I know, uh uh-uh, that's not the voice of my God telling me I'm not enough. That's not the voice of my God telling me I'm going to let everybody down because I don't have to be strong. He is. You see, the thing is, the more of this is at play in your life, the more the basic of the Bible is in your life, the more I can discern between the voices that are constantly beating around in my head and what God's voice sounds like. Because his word says that he's always true to himself. He is the standard. And he spoke to me, 66 books worth. There's 66 books in the Bible. And no, the 67th book of the Bible is not the growth track. It's a joke. The Bible is vital. And the thing is, I know this, I, this is a small little point, but you'll forgive me a little sidebar here because I believe that fellowship with other believers, small group, is essential and vital as you study the Bible because it allows you to have other people around you who can help you discern the voice of God and what the Bible is saying to you. Those actions help us distinguish God's voice in our lives. So let me get intensely practical. 
We've just studied this little section of scripture. I've kind of walked you through idea by idea, but I don't want you to go home today and just go, I learned a little bit something more about the Bible. I want to talk to you for just a quick second about how to study the Bible. In order to do that, I'm going to have three points for you. They're all going to start with R because like I told you, I used to be a worship leader, but apparently now I'm a preacher. So I speak in threes and there's alliteration. I don't know. That's a joke. For you, those, those of you who didn't laugh, alliteration is when you use the same letter at the beginning of the word and you just repeat. Okay, never mind. I'm convinced I found the 85%. It's good, it's good to see you. It's good to see all of you. How do you study the Bible? I have three R's. The first R is read. I know that sounds, I know that sounds overly simplistic, but I'm telling you, you've got to read it and you've got to read it daily. I read a study, and this is not a joke, this is actually quite serious. I read a study from the Center for Bible Engagement. And this was not a small study. This is a study done with over 400,000 responses. And what they did was they studied the effects in a believer's life based on the number of days they read the Bible. Some people responded and said, I read the Bible once a week. Some people said, I read it twice a week. Some people lied. Some people said, I read it three times a week. I know, Christians, right? Some people said, I read it three times a week. This is, they called this study the power of four. Because here's what they found. Believers who read the Bible four days a week reported exponentially. Exponentially is a mathematical term meaning loads of percentage points higher. Exponentially better scores in four very key areas. They were exponentially more likely to share their faith. They were exponentially more likely to remember the scripture they had read They were exponentially more likely to be sexually faithful, and they were exponentially likely to struggle less with mental health. Did you hear what I just said to you? I did not say they did not have anxiety or depression. That's not what the study said. What the study said was reading the Bible helped them find a way to find God in the midst of their issues. Four times a week or more, It was so, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I mean, I read this thing and thought, I cannot believe what I'm reading. It's as if the believers who read the Bible four days or more more, look more like Jesus than those who don't. It was a very challenging study. So how are you going to study the Bible? It seems overly simplistic. The first R is you're going to read it. And when you read it, you're going to open your mind. Now, I know some of you probably walked in here today not expecting the preacher to stand on stage and tell you to be open-minded, but I'm going to tell you something about the Scripture. you got to approach it with your mind open because Jesus is going to challenge you through the Word every time you open it. I find myself challenged on the regular, and I've been in this thing for 30-some-odd-plus years, and I'm telling you something. The more you read of it, the more I find myself challenged. I find myself challenged every time I open the Scripture. There's a promise in the book of Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 23. It says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Watch this. It says, His mercies are new, emphasis my own, every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The thing about the Word of God, the thing about the mercy that He has for you, the thing about the grace that He has for you, the thing about the bounty of blessings that Jesus' perfection fulfilled. Follow me on that for a second. Jesus came and perfectly fulfilled the law, but He did far and above all that. And then the writers of the Gospels wrote about that. Paul wrote about that. The New Testament's chock full of all the blessing that He earned for you in addition to what was required to fulfill the law. And those things are new and ready for you every morning. The reason you're going to read the Bible is because, and get a reading plan. That's where you got to start. Get a reading plan. Follow it. It's not the only way, but it's a great way to form a habit. You're going to read the Bible every day because His mercies are new every morning. There's something new for you every time you read it. A few little, a few little, uh, little tricks I learned from my dad. Pick a spot. Pick a spot and go back to it. Establish a rhythm. Pick a time. There was a period in my life in college when um, I had skipped too many classes and gotten too many cheeseburgers and therefore failed too many courses and lost my scholarship. A whole different story for a different day. But my parents were like, you got to solve this problem. So I had to go make money. So I went to work for some place called the United Parcel Service. For those of you wondering what that is, that's UPS. 
No, not everyone gets to wear a brown uniform. If you're the bottom of the rung, you show up to work at 2.30 in the morning in the back of a semi. Which is where I started. Your boy reported to work at 2.30 a.m. So you know what I did not do? I did not wake up at 1.30 to read my Bible. So his mercies were new every night for me in that, in that case because I would read it in the evening. I think there's power to read it in the morning if you can, but if not, you need to pick a time, pick a rhythm, establish a rhythm, and begin to walk in that rhythm. The more you build that habit, the more you're going to find him speaking to you from his word. This is not a requirement, but I grew up before phones, so uh, I would encourage you when you can, read a paper Bible. And I'll tell you why, why it's important to read a paper Bible. It's because there are no notifications on it. When you're reading the Word and you start to hear from God, I'm telling you, that's a moment when you need to fight for focus. Another study, I'm on the internet reading studies too, too many times, but once people begin to achieve a focused state and you're broken from that focused state, it can take anywhere from 11 to 20 minutes to regain the focus you had. Did you hear what I said? Now, I have four kids and they're hungry and they got to be driven all over the flipping planet, so I don't have 11 to 22 minutes to regain focus. You know what I'm saying? This paper Bible is a necessity. So I can't be, can't be broken from what I'm doing. But you want to write down, take a pen, underline it. You can, you, can write in the, you can write in the sacred text. It's not going to reject your pen. You can, you can underline stuff, get a journal, write some stuff down that God said to you, write some notes as you're musing, as you're reading, look back over that at the end of the week. How do we study our Bible? The first R is you're going to read. The second R is ritual. Ritual here meaning you're going to practice it. I'm going to revisit this later in this series, but here's the thing. It's not enough to just read the Bible. It's not enough to read it and know it. You've got to put it into practice. Let me give you a, let me give you a, a physical example. There's a verse in Proverbs that says, the person who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and he will reward him for what he has done. So I'm reading that verse in Proverbs and it sort of, you know, I, I, it sort of jumps off the page at me. I slow down and think about it for a second. All right, Christopher Fletcher, what does it mean to walk this out practically? What does it look like in your life today to walk out this verse that God tells me to be kind to the poor? Now, I know you're sitting there going, answer the question for us, and I'm not going to do that. You know why? Because it's on you to hear from God when he says... You're to be kind to the poor and therefore lend to him. It's on you to figure out what he's saying to you there in that moment. You got to walk out what the Lord's telling you in the scripture. You got to obey it. You got to do it. I go back to the book of John again. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You know, we all have love languages. We all have ways that we experience love. Maybe it's words of affirmation. Maybe it's touch. No, men, you're not all touch. That's not all your love language. Maybe it's acts of, acts of kindness, acts of service. I don't know. I have a very dear friend, Ben Goodman, who says that God's love language is obedience. The way that we communicate to him that we love him is by obeying his commands. Now, you go, wait a minute, obey his commandments. You mean to tell me I've got to get a pigeon and olive oil and some bread and wave it in the offering before the Lord? Wait a minute. Jesus fulfilled the sacrificial requirements of the law. There's a book in your Bible called Hebrews that does an extra special, really good job of outlining that we don't need to avoid certain foods and have to make animal sacrifices anymore. Jesus established a better covenant. But Jesus also made it crystal clear in the Gospels that we have to obey the commandments outlined in Scripture, not just with our actions, but also with our hearts. Three R's. How are we going to study Scripture? We're going to read it. We're going to make it a ritual part of our life. We're going to obey it. And the third, and this seems like wild oversimplification, but you'll forgive me. I have a very, very small brain. The third is repeat. You got to repeat it. Application comes through repetition. I'll say it again. Application comes through repetition. I read a book by a guy named James Clear. It's called Atomic Habits. One of my favorite books I read a couple years ago. He says, all big things come from small beginnings. 
The seed of every habit is a single tiny decision, but as that decision is repeated, a habit sprouts and grows stronger. The thing is, in many ways, we are the sum of our habits. You don't rise to meet your hopes and dreams for the future. You ride on your habits into the next level of your destiny. You're not the sum of your passions. Gosh, I need you to hear that. I need you to hear that so deeply. We're taught that we can't help the drives and the passions that we have. We may as well just give in to them because we're nothing more than animals who are the sum of our passions. You are not that. You are a vessel handcrafted by God in his identity for a divine purpose. Listen to me. There's a difference between being a slave to your passion and being someone called on mission with a purpose. There's an entire difference between passion and purpose. God created you for a purpose, and the basic of the Bible is the foundation for your next level in your walk with God. The thing is, regardless of whether you've been serving God for 10 years, 10 months, 10 minutes, or if you're about to make Jesus your Lord and Savior here in a second when I give an altar call, regardless, I'm telling you, the next level of your walk with God is built on the foundation of the scriptures. Whatever level, whatever challenge you face next, it's built on the basic of the Bible. In my line of work, people often ask for a silver bullet. Essentially, they'll email or call and say, look, I need the thing that's gonna change my life, change everything in my life today. And to that, I will respond to you. The Holy Spirit can change your life in a moment. So press into him and ask him for breakthrough. But here's the thing. You don't control that. So my response is that, followed by, let's control the controllables. So what are you going to do in the meantime? In the meantime, you're going to invest in the life-changing power of daily Bible reading. There's not one thing a human can give you. It's like asking me to give you something that's going to make you infinitely stronger and grow muscle overnight or drop 25 pounds by tomorrow or wake up and be able to play in the NBA Finals. It's not going to happen. The power of daily Bible reading is that you develop the glue to allow you to wrestle with more of what God is saying to you through his word. You begin to develop the glue as he begins to reveal more of his purpose for your life, more of his plan for your life. As he drops promises into your life, you develop the glue that allows those things to stick. I read to you from uh, Lamentations chapter 3 earlier, and I want to remind you of that right now because whenever a message like this happens... And I've spent my entire life, pastor's kid, I grew up in church. I know how this goes. Really, there's a couple of ways people tend to respond to a message like this. They either say, I feel challenged. This is a challenge. I'm going to rise up to the next level. Or they respond and go, man, I feel behind. I'm late. I'm behind. I haven't, I haven't started. How, how can I catch up? I want to remind you of a verse I just read you a second ago, Lamentations chapter 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. This is what he just said to you. He said, my love never ceases. Chris, I feel behind. Jesus just said to you, my love never ceases. He just said to you, my mercies never end. He just said to you, the bounty of all that I fulfilled and earned for you is available. And when did he say it was available? Every morning. If you feel behind, then it's time to start. Today. Now. It's not, I can't promise you it's going to be easy. And it won't even come naturally. Paul talks about that. We most frequently wage war with the flesh and the desires that rage inside of us. But see, the basics and the basic of the Bible helps us replace what we think we might want with what we need. The basic of scripture is the foundational building block of greatness. The devil's afraid of you. And the more of the word of God you get inside of you, the more dangerous you become. The more of a world changer you become. The more like Jesus you become. This is his word. Romans 10.4 says, Christ is the end of the law. He is the fulfillment of the law. So the more of his word I get in me, the more I begin to look like him. My parents gave me a lot of great gifts. I think one of the greatest gifts that they gave me was a love for scripture and a daily Bible reading habit. 
Because the power of this basic right here is when you pick your head up after a few years of having read this thing every day and look back at what God has done in your life as a result. It's the most powerful thing that I have ever done in my walk with God. And I'm so passionate about it because it's so simple that anyone that can read can do it. It's not a superpower. Anybody that can read can have this basic. It's summer here at Mana Church. So let's apply the basic of a daily walk with Jesus through the pages of scripture and look back at the end of the summer and look at what he's done in and through your life. Bow your heads. Let me pray for you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is living and active. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you help us see Jesus. As I'm praying, I told you there are a couple of different ways you can take this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray for three camps. Camp one, I feel challenged. Father, I pray that you would take each and every one of us challenged to go further in the things of you, Lord. And I pray that you would meet us. Meet every person purposing to read your word at a level they've never experienced before in you. The second camp are those who feel left behind. Father, I pray that you would empower and embolden every person purposing to make this basic a daily habit. I pray that you give them strength. I pray that you give them focus. I pray that you give them... I love that your word says that those who seek me find me. You're not a God who's hard to find. So I thank you. I pray that you would reveal yourself. In the third camp, keep your head bowed for one more moment, for one more prayer. Maybe... I'm talking about this relationship with Jesus thing. Maybe it's not that you're behind. Maybe it's that you haven't ever started. Maybe for you, a relationship with Jesus is an idea. Maybe for me, you know, me talking about reading the word, you've never read God's word. Not only that, you've never spoken to him. You don't have a relationship with him. You're trying to be better. You're trying to do good. You're trying to do the right things. You're trying to attend church. Listen, Paul says in Romans, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we've all got a sin problem. And the way that we make that right is by believing in our hearts and confessing with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, and then we walk in relationship with him. So if you're going, Chris, you're describing my problem, then I want to ask you for a really simple action step with every head bowed and every eye closed. I promise you I'm not going to embarrass you right here in this room and wherever you're watching me. If you say, that's my issue, then I want to ask you to raise your hand and hold it up long enough for me or our site host to see it. If that's you today, you know that you feel that tug in your heart, that you know that you're not right with Jesus, but you want to be. I want to lead you in a prayer. We're going to pray together, so under your breath, I want you to pray and repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I need you in my life. I worship you. I submit myself to you. I want you to come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I want to follow you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, listen, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to please text the name Jesus to the number that you see on the screen and pause this part if you need to. Once you text, you'll receive a prompt. Simply follow what's instructed. Let me just take a moment to say this. Man of Church, this is the most important decision that you'll make in your life, and I'm so happy that you've made it. Here at Man of Church, we believe that it's important to celebrate moments like this with you. So we want to come alongside you and celebrate with you, and we also want to assist you as you begin your personal journey with Jesus. So Mana Church, thank you so much again for joining us online today. If you'd like someone to pray with you, take a moment to text the word prayer to the number that you see on the screen. We have a team that's ready and waiting to connect with you to see how we can pray for you in any area of your life. Also, if you have any questions about about your first steps in the Christian walk, feel free to contact us as well, as well at, at contact at manna.church. God bless you, Mana Church. We'll see you here next week. Same time, same place.
We live in a society where it's hard to get a decent job without a college education. But let's be honest, a piece of paper isn't the only thing that lands you a job. Employers want people that have education and experience. The experience is a full-time college internship that combines both formal academics with practical hands-on training outside of the classroom. While in the experience, students take accredited Bible classes at one of the top 20 Christian colleges in the nation, while gaining world-class leadership training from one of the nation's largest and fastest growing churches. With several degree programs and track options available, the experience allows you to tailor the internship around your personal and professional goals. So maybe you're a young adult looking to pursue vocational ministry, or maybe you're just looking to gain some professional skills and strengthen your biblical understanding before chasing after your dream. Either way, the experience can help you forge a foundation of faith, character, and leadership to equip you for the road ahead.